So I want to present you Dr. Jerome Pisenti, who's already on stage as they prepare his, uh, his slides. He's the VP of Artificial Intelligence at Facebook. He heads up the company's AI research and applied AI teams, FAIR and AML, AML respectively. Uh, he's been working in AI for 20 years, including as CEO of Benevolent Tech, the technology division of Benevolent AI, a British technology company. He's done a lot of things prior to this role. He was VP at IBM Watson, uh, where he led to the creation and development of the IBM Watson platform. He joined I IBM after the acquisition of Vivisimo. Can I say that correctly? Yes. yes. Um, specializing in text mining, uh, text mining and enterprise, enterprise search engines. He's a vis visiting scientist at Carnegie Mellon University's computer science department, and we actually have uh, Professor Kumar from uh, CMU Africa who's here. Um, more recently, he served as co-chair of an independent review on the growth of, growth of AI commissioned by the UK government in 2016. That review's 2007 report led to a sector deal solidifying partnerships between the government and the tech industry to boost innovation in AI. He has a PhD in pure math. I know that our students are very interested in these things. He's a PhD in pure math and degrees in philosophy and cognitive sciences from L'Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. I think I will hand it over to you. There's a fast forward. Thank you. It's not it. Okay, so when Mustafa uh, came to me to uh, suggest uh, starting a master in Africa, I, I immediately said yes. Uh, and I said yes for three reasons. Okay. So let me tell you about them. The first one is, is personal. Uh, I've always been fascinated by Africa, yet I've actually never had really a reason uh, to come here and come visit. So when he mentioned this, I said, you know, I'll come and I'll come for the launch. Uh, it would be a great way to, uh, to come uh, learn about the continent. I've been here for like 32 hours, okay? And I've already been completely amazed by the landscape and, and the people here, you know, really, really amazingly beautiful. But I gotta say, when you have a 200 kilo uh, gorilla that takes a liking of you and comes give you a big slap on the back, uh, that's an experience I'm not ready to, uh, to forget, okay? Uh, and I'm already thinking about bringing my wife and, and kids to come back here, so. That was the first reason. The second reason is what was mentioned earlier. Uh, it's just simple math, right? Uh, the growth and the youth here, the, the talent of the future is going to be here. And for companies like Facebook and Google, uh, talent is key. We are built on talent, and we want to be able to tap into this talent, as Thierry mentioned, right? The third reason is a bit more subtle, and to explain it to you, I need to tell you more about AI and tell you a little bit of the, what's AI for Facebook, why it matters, where we see it going, and how we believe that AI should be done. So let me go through uh, a, a quick presentation here. Um, the first thing I'll tell you all about is, you know, what do we do, uh, why AI matters at Facebook, and how we're trying to use it for uh, the best. Um, AI is kind of everywhere at Facebook. When you open the Facebook app, or the Instagram app, uh, or other Facebook app, the experience actually on these apps is driven by sophisticated deep learning algorithm, machine learning algorithm. The system is trying to determine you know, what content will be the most interesting to you. So everything you see has some machine learning uh, behind it. Now, there are a lot of more visible uh, experiences on Facebook that involve machine learning. So for example, if you uh, ask friends for a recommendation, the system uses sophisticated NLP to identify it and then parse the language of uh, your friends to try to put them on a map and tell you where to go. We also use... Um, machine learning to do automated uh, translation so that if you have friends who speak in a different language, you can actually understand what they do and we support thousands of language pairs on the platform. Another thing we do is that if you have an impairment and you cannot actually look at the pictures of the video, the system actually can use AI to describe to you what the pictures and video are about. We can also use AI to create new experiences. So we launch a bot platform so when you are on a platform, you can interact with a computer through messaging. We are also creating a system that if you upload a video, it understands what that video is about and can create a trailer automatically from, from the video. AI is also at the source of this new experience around augmented reality and virtual reality. Now, AI is especially important for Facebook to kind of protect the community. We are in a place where a lot of content is exchanging. We need to make sure that we can protect people from harmful content. So we try to identify using AI, things like clickbait, 
are things that basically have, are harmful to users. We also identify people in need. Uh, when you use the platform and you say you need mental health help, the system can identify that and put you in contact with first responders. We also identify people we need in blood and put them in contact in different countries with blood donors. We also have some projects that we started with AI outside Facebook. Uh, just recently, we launched an, an idea which was to use sophisticated computer vision algorithm to try to accelerate uh, MRI. But more importantly, AI at Facebook needs to make sure that our products are here to help people and be more valuable to, to people. And so one of the major projects I have in my team is to make sure that the value that people get out of a platform is optimized for their well-being. Now, because AI is so important for Facebook, we are really working hard to make it more intelligent. And I'll tell you a little bit about how that's going. Now, what's amazing about AI is that in the past eight years, it has made amazing progress. So eight years ago, um, people started to use AI and deep learning, you must have heard you know, that term, around using this artificial neural network to do image recognition. And you know, in 2012, we were able to beat the state of the art using deep learning to recognize uh, objects and images. But in the past uh, few years, the system has just got better and better and better, from recognizing objects to identifying their shape, to identifying their skeleton, to being able to do that on a cell phone, to be able to do that in real time on a cell phone. And just at the beginning of this year, we launched a system that not only recognizes your skeleton, but just on a phone, it can identify the surface of your body, and you can imagine all the application that this can have. Now, let me show you a, a little bit a graph I like to, uh, to uh, share. Uh, that was created by OpenAI, a, a, a lab uh, from another organization. And it shows the use of compute in AI. Okay? Every year, basically, the biggest experiment in AI is using 10 times more compute than the year before. And I can tell you that the experiment on the upper right there is quite expensive. Okay? Now, they conclude that uh, this will mean that hardware, and we will need to throw more and more compute at the problem. And I can tell you that even if Facebook and Google have deep pockets, we won't be able to do a lot more compute uh, for the experiment. So what we find at Facebook is that we need to start thinking differently, and that this brute force approach to learning, which is most, you know, usually use things called supervised learning, where you tell the system what to do, and you throw a lot of data at it, uh, have limitations, okay? So we are coming up, actually, with new ways, and we're not the only one, uh, new ways of learning so that we can take all the data existing out there, real-world data, and learn from it. Let me give you some interesting examples. One thing we did recently is, you know, at Facebook, we have access to a lot, a lot of interesting data. And actually, when people use Instagram, uh, they provide us with some tags. You know, you upload your pictures, you put some tags. And so we created a system that can learn from these tags, okay? You don't need to tell it what to do. It will learn from just the old information that's out there, and that's called semi-supervised learning. And we managed to actually beat the state of the art in image recognition by using all the tags provided by all the users out there. Another interesting system uh, that we have used is uh, what we call unsupervised machine translation. So we have a system that can learn to translate from one language to another without ever seeing an example of translation. It's actually quite amazing. It can just read you know, uh, language in English uh, on one side and then read language in, let's say, you know, French in the other side, and can learn to recognize the pattern of the words in both languages and map them without ever seeing an example of a translation. We're also starting to create systems that learn in the real world and can learn from experience in the real world. So we're actually putting robots in the home and asking robots to perform tasks. And the robots can figure out on their own if they are successful or not at grabbing, for example, an object. And the system, by just that experience, without ever having a human telling it if it's right or wrong, can self-supervise its life to learn a task. So just some examples that show you how we're thinking beyond the current state of the art to bring AI to the next level. But the way we think about it is that you know, Facebook is one of the biggest users of AI. And it's really important for us that the state of AI increases, whether or not it comes from my team or from Facebook itself. So we have a big interest to in making this an actually open community for people to contribute to AI you know, from Facebook and from outside and from different universities. So we've created a system, actually, that our research team interacts with many academic uh, uh, um, organizations around the world. 
one of them being Ames, and obviously this master. And so we really aim to create a community of AI specialists that can contribute uh, new algorithms, new data, uh, new data sets uh, to, uh, to the AI community. What we have also done is create a system called PyTorch. Uh, that's an open system for machine learning so that people can learn to do machine learning much faster, much quicker, in a much easier way. It's a system that's designed, that's user-centric, that's much easier to start with, and I expect the students here at Ames will actually try to use it. And we want to basically facilitate the use of AI for everybody, everywhere in the world. We're also providing to the community, we try to open source everything we do. We believe that by open sourcing all our models, we will allow people to build on top of that and make them better. And so everything from speech to vision to text analysis actually is in the open out there for students like you to be able to use them and build and make them better. Okay. Now, it's, with great power like this also comes great responsibility. And the challenge of AI is not just to create things that are very, very powerful, but it's also to create things that work right. And we think that's one of the biggest challenges of AI today. Let me actually give you some example and tell you the, the, the challenges that AI provides. One problem is that people tend to have biases, okay? They have a biased view of the world. And AI system today, as I mentioned earlier, learn from data that comes from people. And unfortunately, the biases that people have tend to go into the data and from that data into the algorithm, which actually basically amplify these biases. And it's really important for us to design systems that will correct these biases rather than amplify them. Let me give you a couple of actually examples that we face at Facebook, okay? The first one is kind of fun and, 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 and uh, seem innocuous, but actually quite difficult. We have a system that can look at a picture and generate an avatar from that picture, okay? To try to represent you in, in a, what's called a social VR, virtual reality or environment. Now, if you ask one person to design a system like this, I guarantee you that they will think of the attributes of their face that are most uh, you know, relevant to them. For example, I've never had a beard or a mustache, and I have no idea that there are actually dozens of types of mustache and beards, okay? And if I were to create a system like this, I will not think of actually looking at all these different types. And you can imagine for all the attributes of a face, people will not necessarily look at all the potential attributes that represent the world population. So to do this, we actually had to go beyond the biases of the people creating it to make sure that whatever attributes we were putting in the system represent the full diversity of the world out there. Let me give you a, a more difficult example that just came out recently for a, 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 a sister company of ours, you know, Amazon, who had some problem around recruiting. Okay? Recruiting is a very, very difficult problem, and when you use machine learning and AI for it, there are lots of pitfalls you need to avoid. So that was a headline that came out just a, few, a month ago about a system that will actually will have bias against women. Okay? And that bias often comes from the data that was used to feed the system. Let me give you a little bit an example in a more relevant way to Facebook. We actually just launched a system that can suggest jobs uh, to users of Facebook, okay? And when you create a system like this, it's pretty tricky because you have to figure out, okay, what are the jobs suggested to what people, right? And if you start segmenting your population, let's, let's imagine you segment it by, you know, gender and age, right? What you need to make sure is that the jobs offered to all these subcategory offer the same amount of economic opportunity. But I can tell you that if you just feed the system and just the data and the historical data, it's very possible that that system will reproduce the bias in the past, that maybe less computer jobs are offered to people who are older, or that less technical jobs are offered uh, to women versus men. So it's really important to create tools and a platform that would analyze you know, how the system performs according to different demographics and make sure that it provides to people across the board the same opportunity. Now, to design a system like this, it's really important to pay attention to this, the people who actually design the system. Let me give you a little story that was given to me by someone in my team, Joelle Pinot. She's one of the movement leaders in my team. And she said that one day she was called you know, to help design a system to do speech recognition for helicopter. And she went there, and the first thing she did is test the system. And she recognized that the system they had didn't work at all with her voice. And guess why? Because the system had been designed by a bunch of dudes, okay, a bunch of guys, and they never thought about putting a woman voice in the system to train it, right? So because they didn't think of people differently than them, they didn't think of designing a system that could account for their diversity. 
And this is really one of my third mission, the third reason why I think the master and mission intelligence in Africa is really important. Because the key to resolving this problem of bias and fairness is to bring a diverse population in the AI community so that the AI system are built by people that represent the world population. So we really not need you, the students of Africa, to be the next people uh, uh, creating the next system in AI. Thank you.